Assalamualaikum and good afternoon everyone. I know uh, this is a like afternoon time sort of sedated kind of time. So but do bear with me as I go on to my topic, sedation practice in critically ill patients. So I'm Dr. Abujaba. I'm an anesthesiologist in Queen 2. I'm also the head of unit in ICU in the Queen 2 as well. So uh, let's move on. So I hope you don't be sedated during this presentation. It's only 138 slides, not much. Don't worry, I cannot inject midazolam or propofol to you through the Zoom. And pay attention, it's an easy topic. Have fun and enjoy the show. Okay, so imagine that you are managing a patient in medical HDU or AIM in a, one of the critical care area. Yeah, is you have an intubated patient with so for severe pneumonia, but uh, currently patient is already there around one or two days. Oxygenation and chest X-ray improving with minimal organ failure, improving AKI with good urine output. No vessel pressures currently, but currently patient looks slightly agitated, moving around, seem restless. And currently on midazolam, two milligram per hour, two mil power usually we uh, our dilution and fentanyl twenty mic per hour usually we dilute 10 mic per mil, about 2, mil, two mils per hour. So what will you do? Uh, I want you guys to try this poll. I will, poll, I will also poll at the same time. Let's see the result later. Azmat, can you uh, manage to get the poll? I'm typing. One, one second. Okay, I can see both is uh, coming in. So just imagine this uh, scenario. I want you to vote as we as I go on. So to save time, we will discuss the options later. All right. Okay, let's continue. So for solution of critically ill, uh, for the first section of my talk, I will be talking about definition, history, goal, and uh, about an ideal sedative agent. So definition of sedation based on the academic works already published uh, is the act of calming patients by the administration of sedative agents. So mind you, this, uh, this so definition has been used for quite some time, but the recent practice and recent evidence have come up that usually this act of calming patients can also be achieved uh, via non-pharmacological methods. Okay, so we, we do think of using, we usually think of using centrally acting pharmacological agents like midazolam, propofol, and so on. But uh, growing evidence have, have shown that uh, non-pharmacological method may equal, if not more effective, to achieve this same effect, which is the act of calming patient. It's very simple definition, okay? So if you look back to the history of sedation practice in ICU, uh, uh, back in 1980s, the mechanical ventilation was quite rudimentary in the sense that the ICU and critically ill, critically care, critical care use a high dose sedative agent causing very deep sedation, as ventilators at that time not tolerating well with spontaneously breathing patient. So those days, they, they call the sleeping ICU, though most of the patients sedated, deep sedated all, almost all the time. So as the mechanical ventilation advanced, the development of spontaneously breathing mode and better synchronization with mandatory modes lead to reductive reduction in the use of sedative agent. So it really started from the year 2000 when Kress et al. Uh, published his single center RCT. And this has been done to show the daily sedation. Uh, at this time, Kress shown that when they started to stop the sedation, it leads to a better uh, reduction in days of mechanical ventilation 
and reduce the need for imaging for prolonged JCS recovery. So we, we used to repeat, do CT brain, why the patient is late waking up. So it found out that when he started to stop sedation intermittently, patients uh, seem to fare better. In 2002, the adoption of a better sedation practice was started on uh, 2002 in by SCCM uh, through their PAD guideline. The well-acclaimed PAD guideline published starting to recognize the need to shift from deep sedation to light sedation. Okay, so numerous and then from 2006 onward, numerous RCT and meta-analysis published over the last two decades, almost two decades to practically establish uh, our sedation practice in critically in critical care. So from the dark ages, we, we move towards the future, towards lighter and lighter state of sedation without agitation. How about the future? Are we going to have uh, less and less sedation? The depression will become more awake, uh, no sedation at all. So we will venture into this. So the goals of ICU sedation is uh, quite simple. You want a patient to be calm, comfortable, cooperative. You want, to, you want to reduce anxiety and agitation in the patient. You want to facilitate mechanical ventilation and you want to decrease traumatic memory of ICU stay and the traumatic memory of procedures in the ICU, in the critical care. Okay. So ideal properties of sedative agents uh, are as follows. You want a drug to have a fast and predictable onset and offset. Uh, you want to have a favorable awakening profile for the patient. The patient will be calm, comfortable, comfortable, able to communicate pain, or able to communicate with you as the healthcare provider. And you want the patient to have a preserved respiratory drive. So you don't want to be, you give sedation and the patient can't breathe after that. You want to have it uh, the sedation, if possible, need to have some analgesic property and uh, you need to have uh, organ independent metabolism. And of course, he needs to be safe hemodynamically because our patient in critical care usually have uh, vasopressor support, inotropes and so on. And they're also a bit unstable hemodynamically, so we want it to be safe in terms of hemodynamic profile. So moving on, the next important section, uh, as we move on from the previous decades and to now, the current practice, we are moving from deep sedation towards light sedation. So why light sedation is preferred compared to deep sedation? So before moving forward, I want to show you what is the good and the bad side of sedation for critically ill. So the good side for the sedation in critically ill, it will reduce overall oxygen consumption facilitate tolerance to treatments, reducing harmful event like unplanned extubation and so on, and increasing comfort level of patient. Okay, so because uh, ICU survivors commonly complain of anxiety in addition to pain during ICU stay, and some have developed quite bad PTSD. Okay, so the bad side of sedation is that when you use sedation too much or too deep, it can increase ventilator complication like BAP, ventilator lung injury, and prolonged ventilation days requiring tracheostomy and hemodynamic impairment like hypotension, bradycardia could happen. And uh, uh, believe it or not, the more you use sedation, the, the worse the delirium will be and the, more, the worse the agitation will be. Okay. And uh, it will also prolong treatment duration, prolong ICU length of stay and prolong awakening and delay extubation. So this is sort of the good and the bad side that you want to argue. So most of the time, deep sedation is bad. Patients unable to communicate pain, loss of human contact. Patients uh, usually have delirium. The more, the longer the deep sedation you give to the patient. And patients tend to have a hemodynamic instability, prolonged mechanical ventilation and increased mortality. And uh, multiple other long-term physical and psychological consequences such as muscle fatigue and weakness, cognitive impairment, PTSD, and so on. So uh, if we collate and combine our, uh, multiple studies together, you can see that a lot of papers have truly established deep sedation is really bad, okay? Among negative consequences of prolonged deep sedation is that deep sedation reduced six month survival, it increased hospital mortality, it, it will prolong duration of mechanical ventilation, 
it will prolong ICU length of stay. So, however, the proponent of deep sedation will say that light sedation will increase physiological stress in terms of elevated catecholamine, increased oxygen consumption, but these two doesn't show any clear relationship with uh, worse clinical outcome. In fact, the, like, like I shown in the beginning, the deep sedation is very bad. So in this uh, quite remarkable paper by Shehab, Yahya Shehabi, it has been shown, this is quite famous, usually cited uh, hundreds of times. And uh, it shows here the early deep sedation and prolonged deep sedation, longer lengthen the mechanical ventilation and reduce six months survival. Okay, so more the more you deeper the, uh, the more you sedate the patient, the deeper you sedate the patient, they will have longer time to be extubated and they will have a uh, higher mortality as well. Okay, so how about uh, mental health after the light or deep sedation? So this uh, interesting RCT done by Trey Giari, uh, he recruited 137 adults into group into light and deep sedation. Okay, so the result was uh, the primary endpoints for deep sedation was uh, the, the, the patient in deep sedation trend toward more having more PTSD symptoms, more trouble remembering the event, more disturbing memories of the ICU. Uh, however, there were no difference in anxiety or depression score. Other endpoints, they have shown that light sedation uh, tend to have uh, one day shorter on mechanical ventilation and one and a half days shorter length of stay. Okay, so Moving into the more practical uh, aspect, how do we practice sedation in the critically ill? Uh, mainly, we look into sedation target from different guidelines. So, the best uh, sedation score is not the same as GCS, okay, but it's almost there. So, we always use this uh, very heavily uh, validated, proven, and the most widely, widely used score is a RAS score, R-A-S-S, Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale. It's quite easy to use. The, now, the marks is from negative five to plus four. For zero is alert and calm. If patient open eyes spontaneously, have good eye contact, obey command and able to communicate. So from negative five, usually it's unarousable. You, you tap the patient, hello, hello, hello. You move the patient, uh, you call the name. It's unarousable, no response to voice or physical stimulation. Uh, if the patient is negative four, it's deep sedation. No response to voice, but you're showing some response to physical stimulation. When you move him, move his shoulder and move his body, he seems to move and make some movement, make some wincing and so on, and show some response. You can consider it's minus four. So minus three, respond to, move, respond to voice, but no eye contact. And minus two is light sedation, patient awakes, respond to voice with eye contact briefly, but less than 10 seconds. And uh, drowsy, uh, patient awaken, respond to you, respond to voice, having good eye contact, more than 10 seconds. Okay, so we uh, alert and calm, open eyes spontaneously, good eye contact, awake common and able to communicate. So the rest, if you, as you can see, the more agitated the patient is, the more higher the score will be. So what do we want the patient, uh, in based on the evid evidence base, what do you want what is the target that we want? Usually we want, uh, based on the papers published and the evidence available, uh, we, uh, we aim for the patient to be negative two to plus one almost all the time. So the best is zero to minus one, okay? The best is zero. Okay, so how do we do this? Uh, we practice in critical care. There's a targeted level of consciousness. First, we choose target RAS. We assess the actual RAS. We modify the treatment so actual equals the target. Okay, then we do it again and again and again, every shift, every eight hours. Okay. So how do we target the sedation level? What are the guidelines say? Uh, okay, so the, the uh, I will tell you about the three guidelines. So number one is a 2018 by this guideline. This is the, the best and the most widely used international guideline on uh, critical care patient and number two is the e-cash guideline and number three is our own local guideline okay so this is the 2018 parties guideline so 2018 parties guideline recommended using light sedation in almost all the time in almost all patients mechanically ventilated adult critically ill 
compared to deep sedation. Okay, so they suggest to use RAS minus 2 to plus 1. And then light sedation, minus 2 to plus 1, based on this guideline, says that it shortened the time to extubation by one day and reduced tracheostomy rate 50%. Okay, so that's, that's an e cash guideline. Also say you have to aim for light level of sedation. Light sedation maintains patient in a state in which they are calm, comfortable, and cooperative. Ideally, sedated patient should be arousable in order to maintain eye contact, interact with caregivers and family, participate in physical or occupational therapy, be permitted to drift off to sleep when uninterrupted. So, of course, uh, we also have to follow our own local guideline. Uh, MSIC, Malaysian Society of Intensive Care, have published in 2019 uh, a full ICU management protocol meant for critical care area such as ICU, HDU, HDW, and so on. So for sedation, uh, they have uh, stated that uh, we, we should aim for minus two to plus one RAS score. So when does deep sedation is indicated? So from IC management protocol, they specify only nine indi specific indication for deep sedation to be used. Number one is cerebral protection. Number two is post cardiac arrest care. Of course, we should require cerebral protection in the first place. Number three is high vasoactive agents, high ventilator setting, prone position, massive pulmonary hemorrhage, severe broca asthma or COPD, tetanus, and on non neuro on neuromuscular blocking agent on paralysis. So the two targets of sedation in ICU we divide it into two deep sedation, plus minus three to minus five, uh, only for nine specific indication and light sedation for RAS minus two to plus one for majority of ICU patient. Okay. Uh, moving on to choice of sedation, uh, evidence-based uh, approach, okay? So it's basically, uh, this is my, uh, my favorite movie. The first, uh, it's a movie about Fight Club. So the first rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. But in this Fight Club between the sedative agents, they talk a lot about this. In the, in the international guideline, international papers, they talk a lot, talk and talk, talk a lot about between uh, what sedative agents is the best and uh, what is the evidence out there. So the decades long fight club is between the time tested midazolam, the versatile propofol and the new kit on the blocks, which is Presidex. Okay. So if you go back to the history of sedation practice in ICU, uh, from 2006 onward, it, then at that time, it started to have the, the fight clubs started off in a really big way. Uh, from the first uh, in 2009 in from setcom trial okay so round one the fight club between the fight between dax medetamidin and midazolam so at this point of time in 2009 deep sedation is still uh with they 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 sort of starting to move from deep sedation to light sedation and uh, uh, dax medetamidin only come into picture at this point of time so in this trial uh, one of the uh, blockbuster trial at that time they will say is a they, they include 741 patient enrolled into dex and media groups and with the primary outcome with time spent within the rust target so at that time the primary outcome shown there was no different in percentage of time within the rust target rust range and secondary outcome it shows that delirium during treatment was 54 percent in dex group and 76 percent in midazolam group so it shows that delirium reduction of 22.6 percent and median time to extubation was almost two days shorter for dexmedetomidine. However, the length of stay of both group was similar. And they found out that dexmedetomidine group were more likely to develop bradycardia with a non-significant increase in the proportion requiring treatment. Okay. So if you can see here from SETCOM trial, uh, when they found out in the secondary outcome is that uh, from the first five days, Dexmedetomidine shows a remarkable reduction in delirium compared to a patient that was on midazolam. At this point in time in 2009, midazolam was a very popular, the most preferred choice of sedative agent. So it's sort of like trying to challenge the position of midazolam as the king of sedative agent at that time. Uh, are we still stuck in the 2009 era? I hope, I don't think so. I hope not. Okay. So at that time, SETCOM trial shown that uh, the time to extubation is shorter, but the ICU length of stay is similar. So at first glance, when you see a paper or trial, uh, 
you can just you can say primary outcome uh, no difference so so what, what's the point <laughs> Actually, it shows, uh, it, it shows and it gives us a lot of clinical information. So at that time, uh, dexamethasone is still quite new, uh, quite promising. It shows that both drugs, actually both midazolam and dexamethasone was effective in achieving the target RAS. So they see uh, how many percentage of time patients spend in the target RAS. So the target RAS from minus two to plus one. So they want to see from the duration of the study period, how long uh, the patients spend the time in the target RAS. So both of it shows that both drugs are equally effective in terms of the primary uh, target of sedation. Okay. So at that time it was uh, like a can opener at the time when Imunazolam was preferred and transition into light from the darkness was happening. Mechanical ventilation days reduced by almost two days. You can imagine you can extubate patient two days earlier, you can free up the beds faster, patient gets better faster. So of course mortality will be better. And delirium was 22.6% lower in the semenotomidine group. And in this trial, we know that uh, the use of loading dose in dexamethasone can have some side effect like uh, bradycardia and hypotension. I will tell this further on later. Okay, so it can also, dexamethasone can also help with tachycardia and hypertension. So round one, both drugs achieve similar time spent on target RAS. Both drugs are equally useful and effective if you want to sedate patient in the target RAS of minus two to plus one. Okay, so each midazolam shows a more cardiostable, less bradycardia, and less hypotension. So, but uh, the presidex, the uh, dexmedetomidine shown to have a two days earlier extubation and 22.6% delirium reduction. Okay, round two, when dexmedetomidine become more popular, they started to do more trial and even bigger trial involving midazolam and propofol. So this trial was called BDEX Prodex trial. So after 2009 SETCOM trial, the, uh, the, the second PAD guideline was published in 2013, which uh, adopt uh, SETCOM trial results. And uh, the target RAS was adopted at the first time as negative two to plus one at the time by PAD guideline. And the use of uh, dexamethasone started to be recognized by PAD guideline. And then they want to build work more on that. They started doing, they complete the Midex product trial in 2014. So Midex product trial, twin trial was, uh, it's a parallel trial twin design. Twin trials to primarily investigate dexamethasone in more depth. So Midex, Midex means Mida versus Dex, Prodex means Propofol versus Dex, total of 1,000 patients with a primary outcome of uh, non-inferiority of Dex compared to Midazolam and Propofol. Secondary outcome of to see what superiority of dexamethasone have against Mida and Propofol. So the primary outcome was dexamethasone was not inferior, so they do achieve their target. It shows similar primary efficacy versus Midazolam and Propofol. There were no statistically significant difference between the time spent within the target RAS. Okay, so in all, uh, in average, uh, all three drugs shown that uh, there are the all three drugs can be used as a sedative agent in critical care and all three drugs shown to have around 60 percent of patients spend within the spend the same time within the target RAS. so what are the difference between the three drugs based on this trial so as you can see here uh, the between me the midazolam and dexamethasone uh, the median me mechanical ventilation hours was shorter in dexamethasone group and it's about the same p value 0 0.24 it's about the same between propofol and dexamethasone okay so the secondary outcomes shows that uh, dexamethasone maintains higher percentage of patient at favorable ras of minus 1 to 0 if you remember the minus 1 to 0 is uh, although we target minus 2 to plus 1 the better the better sedation that we want to achieve is actually RAS minus one to zero is better for the patient and for overall outcome. So dexamethasone actually maintains higher percentage of patient at favorable, more favorable RAS of minus one to zero. And the other set outcomes are time spent on mechanical ventilation. It shows to be uh, favoring dexamethasone shorter by 41 hours, uh, extubated earlier. And, but product trial shows propofol and dexamethasone is shown about the same. So in terms of arousability, MIDEX trial, both MIDEX and product trial seem to be, uh, shows 
benefit towards dexmedetomidin in the sense that uh, in patient on dexmedetomidin significantly more arousable and more awake most of the time and calm compared to both MIDA and Propofol. So they have higher score compared to MIDA of 30 and 49.7 for DEX and uh, Propofol 40 and DEX was uh, 51.3. Uh, like I said, the, from the first secondary outcome, uh, more patient seems to spend time in a RAS 0 to minus 1, more favorable RAS, okay? Higher percentage, almost 30, 20 to 30 percent higher, okay? So uh, for duration of mechanical ventilation, MIDEX trial show dexmedetomidin shows uh, faster extubation compared to midazolam, but the product trial propofol and dexmedetomidin shows to be the same. So like I said, the VAS score, arousability score in dexmedetomidin compared to propofol and midazolam, they show better communication, patient can communicate pain more, better, uh, patient more arousable and patient is more cooperative. If you can see here, the, the marks almost double than the midazolam and almost one third higher than uh, the propofol. Okay, uh, however, uh, a, a bad side towards that medium is that it's shown to have more hypotension and bradycardia when compared to midazolam. Okay, so that medium is shown hypotension of 20.6% of time versus 11.6% in midazolam and uh, radicardia of 14.2% versus 5.2%. So, okay. So the product trial, uh, however, propofol and dexmedetomidin shown to be about the same. Okay. So compared to MIDA, MIDA have shown, have been shown to be uh, more cardiostable. Okay. However, hypotension and bradycardia during MIDEX and product trial doesn't require uh, excessive resuscitation, it just needs to be stopped and the, the hemodynamic impairment will uh, quickly resolve. So round two, MIDEX trial shown that similar time span within target RAS, so both drugs are equally effective. Uh, Midazolam shown to have uh, less hypotension, less bradycardia and uh, Next monitor is shown to have excellent awakening profile, better communication with the healthcare worker, uh, better cooperation, uh, better arousability, and less time spent on mechanical ventilation. So from project trial, it should be shown that both propofol and exmenitomidine have similar time spent within target RAS, similar time spent on mechanical ventilation, similar incidence of hypotension and bradycardia. Uh, and then uh, Desmonotomidin shown compared to Propofol have excellent awakening profile, more awake, more arousable and calm. Okay, so now three, when Desmonotomidin uh, getting more and more popular, the mega fight happened from uh, Desmonotomidin versus usual care. So they pitted Desmonotomidin as a, a versus usual care so the clinician can use either Propofol or Midazolam. So, then came the SPICE-3 trial in which uh, the investigator from Australia and New Zealand uh, collaborated all over the world. There's a global studies. And this was also involving Malaysia and Sabah at the same time. So Sabah, Queen Elizabeth Hospital, uh, having the most number of patients recruited in Malaysia. So we are the top recruiter in Malaysia for this SPICE-3 trial. Uh, among the in the in the global scale, we are not the the, the highest lah, of course. So, but in the Malaysia, we are the top recruiter in in for the Spice Three trial. So, in the two thousand nineteen Spice Three study, uh, they investigate they investigated dexmedetomidine as a primary or sole agent. They want to see because dexmedetomidine have uh, shown a lot of promising promise and lots of benefit. They want to see whether we can use this agent as a sole uh, or primary agent. So those use was starting at one mic per kilo per hour to a maximum of 1.5 mic per kilo per hour. It is way higher than usual dose currently practiced in the ICU. And uh, primary outcome, they want to see 90 days mortality. And the secondary outcome, they want to see side effects. So the result was uh, 4,000 patients was enrolled for this study. And the primary outcome, there was no difference between 90 day mortality uh, between dexamethamidine versus usual care. So around about around 29% mortality rate of the ICU patient, which is sort of uh, conforming to the global average as well. So that's medium versus usual care. Uh, the deaths at 180 days are the same. 
institutional dependency also the same, cognitive decline as our assessment of cognitive decline also the same, quality of life also the same. So however, in the Spicer trial, they found out that dexamethasone shows a, a shorter, more days free from coma, means a shorter duration of coma, a patient gets awake faster, and shorter duration of ventilation, more, more median ventilator free days, means patient having more free days from ventilator, means or they are they extubated earlier by one day. And uh, spicery trial shows us a very important outcome as well. Bradycardia was 5.1%. If you can remember, in the midex products, in midex trial, it shows to be around 14%. And hypotension in the spicery trial is only 2.7%. If you can, you can remember, in the midex product trial, it was uh, around 20% hypotension. So the larger the studies, the better, the more accurate the numbers or incidence. So this study is very important that in showing the true number of uh, critical incidents when you are using the dexamethasone. So at first glance, primary outcome seems there was no different, but SPICE 3 tells us important clinical information is in, in the sense that it is not meant for higher doses for deep sedation. Uh, if you want to deep sedate the patient using dexamethasone, you will need to have you will, you will require high dose that produces more bradycardia, hypotension, and asystole events. Dosage used in SPICE 3 is way above suggested dose for ICU sedation. Usually, we do not use beyond one mic per kilo per hour. Okay? So reinforced, this study reinforced that dexamethasone will increase ventilator free days by one day and coma free days by one day. So it's conformed to the SETCOM Midex product trial uh, advantage in terms of earlier extubation and uh, earlier awakening. So round three, the mega five. Uh, that's when it shows shorter by one day on mechanical ventilation, lesser one day spent on coma, bradycardia and hypertension not as bad as previously thought. And there were no, however, there were no difference in 90 days mortality between the two and no difference in connective decline. So how about delirium? If you remember, SETCOM trial shows 22.6% reduction in delirium. So more study have been conducted after that. Uh, this is a SETCOM trial. Delirium reduction by 22.6%. And uh, further on, the Dahlia trial tried to try to look into more specific outcome on just delirium alone. alone. So this is quite a relatively small study of 71 patients, RCT. Uh, it shows that uh, dex immunotomidine shows an increased accelerated median time to resolution of delirium by 20 hours, almost twice uh, as fast compared to the usual care. Okay, and at the same time, they show that uh, dexamethasone gets extubated faster by 20 hours as well. Okay, so in the latest trial earlier this year, it was published that dexamethasone versus propofol in terms of delirium reduction. Uh, it has been shown that delirium reduction between dexamethasone and propofol is about the same. Okay. Uh, also, the same has been shown in uh, mid product trial as well. So, in terms of delirium reduction, uh, dexamethasone and propofol around the same outcome for delirium. Okay, so men's two trial shows a uh, number of days alive without delirium is the same. Uh, no significantly different between dexamethasone and propofol groups. Uh, all significant, all secondary endpoints, endpoints also no significant different. Okay, so what can we learn from the second men trial? Uh, that's monotomy and profile consider equipoise position with respect of everything from efficacy and adverse effect. Both have its own advantages and limitations. So round four, conflicting results. So SETCOM and Dahlia seem to show uh, delirium reduction in that's monotomy. And however, Midex Prodex trial and SPICE 3 trial uh, doesn't seem to show any uh, benefit of delirium reduction in that's monotomy. And if you can remember men's two trial just now, uh, that's monotomidine and profile have, having about the same effect on delirium. So uh, moving on the mechanism of action of sedative agents, uh, let's take a look more into it. Okay, so uh, if you can see uh, that's monotomidine is a, it's a sedative agent with a unique sedative uh, mechanism of action. Uh, for benzodiazepine like midazolam and propofol, they mainly act on the GABA ion channel in the brain and the function is to uh, increase duration 
and uh, increased frequency of opening of this chloride ion channel. So when they open up with the effect of benzodiazepine and propofol, they have a multiple different side of binding and action on the GABA ion channel. It will increase uh, influx of chloride and will cause membrane hyperpolarization that will cause CNS depression. So for uh, dexamethasone, it act completely different in the sense that they act on the they are a selective alpha two adrenoceptor agonism. Okay, so they cause uh, they bind into the uh, nerve endings, neuro neuronal network uh, transmission. Uh, they bind into the alpha two receptor, causing ego agonist action, agonism action. Uh, one they causing negative feedback and then prevent the norepinephrine to be released from the new, new neuron terminal. And when less neurotransmitter of norepinephrine being released at the neuroneuronal junction, the stimulation of the alpha-2 receptor will be reduced. Alpha-2 receptor agonism also will reduce the uh, transmission of the uh, neuroneuronal transmission uh, that will reduce CNS depression and causing sedation. So it inhibits at the presynaptic alpha-2 adenoceptor activation, it will inhibit the release of norepinephrine. At the postsynaptic alpha-2 adenoceptor activation, it will blunt sympathetic activity by reducing signal transmission to effector organs. So it's completely different from the action of benzodiazepine and also propofol. Okay, so that's monotomidine also have uh, multiple other effects in different organs. Uh, they can cause... Uh, they can cause uh, sedation, of course, and they can cause energy via decreased release of substance P, and they also have uh, non sinus effects such as bradycardia hypotension, diuresis, and sometimes they can cause hypertension when given as bolus. So dosage and administration of sedative agent. So this is taken from the Malaysia ICU guideline. Uh, I will explain later regarding analgo sedation. So fentanyl is also being put as one of the option for sedation at a dose of uh, 100 to 200 mic per hour, infusion dose of up to 500 mic per hour is very high dose, okay? And uh, you can use propofol around one to two milligram per kilo, and you can go up to four milligram per kilo per hour. So usually I will use around one and one and a half milligram per kilo per hour for patient, okay? So for midazolam, this is the dose, and that's midazolam we use from 0.2 to 0.7 mic per kilo per hour. Okay, so the side effect for all there is like uh, this. Uh. So propofol is cumulative in hepatic impairment, can cause fatty liver if used for too long or too much and too long, and can cause hypertension, hyperthyroidemia, pancreatitis, proportional infusion syndrome, and infection. This infection, because propofol is a soy-based drug, yeah, you cannot uh, use after you have break the vial and more than eight hours. After that, you have to discard it. So you want to reduce and prevent infection. Okay, so midazolam can cause respiratory depression and uh, hypotension, delirium, agitation. Desmolotinin can cause hypotension, bradycardia, and loss of airway reflexes. If it's don't loss of airway reflexes, usually only occur if we use very high dose. So more on the desmolotinin because it is such a such the latest drug and uh, almost almost there, almost there, almost an ideal agent, but not, not there yet. Okay, so desmolotomidine has a distinct mechanism of action. It also has a exhibit opioid sparing properties. As you can see here from this study, it shows that a reduction of uh, use of fentanyl, uh, or use of uh, opioids and fentanyl during uh, procedures and surgeries. And the most important thing is that desmolotomidine maintains respiratory stability. Okay, so dexamethasone is associated with limited respiratory effect. In contrast to infusion of opioid, benzodiazepine, or propofol, it can be safely infused through tracheal extubation. So when we want to extubate patient, we usually will not have, we don't have to off the uh, dexamethasone. We can continue to use it during extubation. Okay, hypercapnic arousal is preserved, and the apnea threshold is actually decreased. So this is very important in the sense that our, our, our breathing is actually governed by respiratory drive from the respiratory center. So when the CO2, PCO2 of our blood increase, 
it will also increase the PCO2 in the brain and it will cause some acidosis in the in the ice and the, in, uh, in the uh, in the brain in the ICP sorry ICP, uh, CSF yeah CSF acidosis will cause reduction in pH and CSF that will stimulate the respiratory uh, center to create a, a strong uh, stim respiratory, respiratory drive for patient to breathe. Okay, so if you give patient midazolam and propofol, it will obtain this respiratory, uh, it will obtain this response of ventilatory response from the respiratory drive to CO2. Okay, our body uh, largely relies on uh, CO2 arousal for respiratory drive. So compared to midazolam and propofol, dexmedetomidine seems to preserve and not obtain this important uh, response to CO2, ventilatory response to CO2. Okay, so that's why it's a maintained respiratory stability and can be used during extubation. Uh, Dexmedetomidine also reduces sympathetic drive. As you can see here, uh, this, this study shown that uh, during intubation, they can use this to uh, control the heart rate and uh, BP during intubation. So it has a distinct sedative profile. Patient can be often easily aroused and it's not in the, uh, calm, comfortable and able to communicate. Okay, so and able to follow instruction and perform simple tasks. Uh, it also as efficacious as other sedative agents, the older and more time-tested midazolam and propofol and also shown to be uh, lesser delirium. And okay, and they also, like I said before, this metamidine maintains more patient in the more favorable rust range. And this is uh, from SATCOM trial, it also reduces time to extubation by almost two days. And from MIDEX and product trial, it uh, reduces the time by 40 hours and com when compared to midazolam. Uh, in a full analysis of studies, this metamidine was associated with better outcome over standard care. Uh, shorter mean time to extubation, shorter mean duration of mechanical ventilation, shorter mean duration of ICU stay. Okay, so when you use dexamethamidin in the midex product trial, it has been shown that patient can communicate be communicate better, can co convey pain better, and uh, arousability is arousability is better, and also cooperative cooperation from patient also much better. Okay. So it also preserves cognitive function. When you use it uh, in ICU patient, cognitive function was shown to improve in patient receiving dexamethamidine for sedation, whereas it worsened in those receiving propofol. So going into choice of sedation from clinical guideline, uh, mainly I'll be using these two guidelines and uh, to show you the adoption of these trials, evidence, and development into guidelines. So how do how these two, one international guideline and Malaysia protocol use, uh, adopt these trials in, uh, in recommending our sedation practice in critical care. So both guidelines uh, emphasis on analgo sedation. Okay, they have high emphasis on analgo sedation. They should, they say, they are saying uh, treat pain first. Okay, only when pain is controlled, when NRS, VAS, CPOT less than three, VPS less than five, if not, if target not achieved, then only start sedative agent. Okay, so when you control the pain and you see where if the patient still agitated, still moving around, rust still combative, rust plus two, plus three, plus four, then only you can then only you start sedative agent. You have to control the pain first. Okay, analgo sedation means analgesia sedation first. So why? Because ICU and critical care has been shown to be very painful. Okay, procedures do hurt. Procedures like turning, wound drain removal, wound care, chest tube removal, arterial line insertion has been shown to be the most, this five is the most painful uh, procedures in for the patient, okay? Even turning. Turning is actually based on the, based on the, this study uh, done by Puntilo. Turning is even more painful than arterial line insertion, okay? So, uh, be, uh, be mindful about it. And also, like others procedure, like endotracheal suction is also painful, tracheal suctioning, femoral removal, peripheral blood draw, peripheral IV line insertion, 
So when you think about it, you have to control pain for the patient. Okay. So how to assess pain in ICU? So I include this because it's uh, we are moving towards uh, analgo sedation practice and self-report scale is the most important standard of pain assessment in patient who can communicate with you. If patient can communicate with you, the best is NRSV. NRS means numerical rating scale, pain score from zero to 10, okay? So when they compare between a, uh, a lot of uh, methods of self-reporting of pain is that this NRSV is the most reliable method. Uh, you have to print as large as possible and show to the patient what number and then uh, they will choose uh, what number of pain that they are currently having. So this is the, the uh, result from that study. Okay, how to, uh, if, how, how about if the patient cannot communicate with you? So usually some patient intubated, still not uh, awake yet. You, you, you don't know how to ask the patient pain score, but you do have to assess the pain as well. So for critically ill adult unable to self-report pain, you, you have to use behavioral assessment tool. Okay, so you have to do stepwise approach. Attempt to obtain patient self-report of pain, gold standard. If a patient is intubated but can communicate with you, you can show them, then they will choose number of pain, the pain score. Okay, then you look for the behavioral, behavioral changes using the tool if they cannot, uh, cannot communicate with you. Okay, so this is the CPOT score and this is the BPS score. Okay, you can Google it and you can find it. So, you treat pain first, then only you see the rust. If the rust still not achieved, then you start sedative agent. So this is the energy cell that can be used in the critical care. You can use, usually our main, main drug of choice will be opioid and the main drug will be fentanyl most of the time. Okay. And you can use morphine. Uh, I, I do use a lot, use a lot of ketamine in certain cases, ketamine, PCM, and uh, I mean, fentanyl is very expensive, so we don't use it often, but it's a future drug. Lah. Okay, and you can use also oxycodone, and you can also use tramadol and gabapentin. So I, I've been, we use fentanyl almost all the time, and I do add on IPCM and ketamine. Nowadays, I use ketamine quite a lot also. So the threshold for significant, of significant pain, if you have patient, an RSV uh, pain score of three or more, BPS five or more, support of three or more, you should treat the pain, okay? Energesia should be treated accordingly to achieve better pain control for patient in ICU to stay, in ICU to approach uh, pain and rest and pain during procedure. So pain and rest uh, is the pain that occurs all the time because of the uh, same positioning all the time, barring, such a, and having entity inside the, the throat, and then pain during procedure is all the preceded I've shown just now. And so you have to actively and aggressively look for pain. So treating the pain is the most important thing in the critical care area. So you can't rely reliably, you, you vital sign cannot be rely reliably. It's a not a reliable indicator for pain. Vital sign should not be used alone to assess pain. May be used as Q, but you have to assess further actually for the pain. So in 2018, by this guideline, after you already treat the pain, if you cannot achieve the target RAS, sometimes, most of the time, when we give the fentanyl, patient is already comfortable, alert, calm. So you do not need to start anything, midazolam or what. Okay, so for no, for patient not undergoing cardiac surgery, for medical patients, for your patient, medical patient, you can use either propofol or dexamethasone over benzodiazepine. Okay, so benzodiazepine midazolam is not preferred anymore for sedation in critically ill, mechanically ventilated adult. So propofol versus benzodiazepine. Propofol, like I said, this is all the study that I have shown you just now. Okay, for cardiac surgery patient, we recommend using propofol over benzodiazepine for sedation in mechanically ventilated adult. So how about physical restraint? In uh, 2018 Paris guideline. They, they say that uh, physical restraint have no evidence to say against or for, for or against. So they are taking neutral stance in the sense that uh, they know physical restraint can be uh, of use, but it cannot be uh, excessively um, uh, deployed or used. Okay? 
So they have, uh, interesting to note that the use of physical restraint in one study of 15,000 ICU patients, the use of physical restraint lead to more unplanned extubation, frequent reintubations, more unintentional, unintentional device removal, longer length of stay, increased agitation, higher medication use, and increased use of delirium. So in the ICU, Malaysia ICU management protocol, you can see here, uh, you, you can see here, uh, first they say light sedation, aim RAS minus two to plus one. Use analgesia first sedative, okay? Morphine or fentanyl in mechanically ventilated patient. If you already treat the pain, the pain is uh, zero or patient say that he's not in pain, but if patient is still agitated and additional sedative are required, non-benzodiazepines are preferred over benzodiazepine due to lower incidence of delirium. If propofol or dexamethasone is used, consider patient's hemodynamic status, anticipated duration of duration, duration of sedation, drug availability, and cost. In hemodynamic unstable patient, either at IV midazolam, initial N1 milligram per hour and titrate, or use high dose fentanyl alone. Okay, so this uh, the deep sedation that I show you in the beginning. Okay, so the decades long fight club uh, from of the three drugs boils down to midazolam is uh, not favored nowadays but still have a role uh, usually for deep sedation as you can see in the beginning patient when they admitted to critical care they have high vessel pressure high ventilator setting yes you can use you should use midazolam okay you should put the patient in deep sedation to tolerate the treatment at that time you can use midazolam but you do not have to use you actually have to stop midazolam as soon as possible as soon as you think the patient is improving, okay? Uh, not favored, but still have a role in deep sedation, alcohol withdrawal, palliation, and seizure control because benzodiazepine is an excellent anti-epileptic as well. Propofol is versatile, predictable, and fast onset and offset have been resurgent in the ICU world, almost equivalent with dexamethasone. Dexamethasone, is it a magic drug? It, it, it does offer clear awake sedation profile have preserved respiratory effort, can exhibit patient while on the drug, but you do have to be concerned and remember on the hypertension and bradycardia side effect. So how about no sedation? This is from the analgo sedation, analgo sedation concept put into an actual trial, non steda study. Okay, so this trial was published in year 2020, 2020 last year. It challenges the sedation strategy versus no sedation strategy that we are currently being recommended to use. Uh, so the intervention was the no sedation, patient received a no routine sedation, emphasis on analgo sedation, bolus doses of morphine or fentanyl for analgesia. In this trial, they use morphine most of the time. Uh, sedation could be given after both non-pharmacological and pharmacological were given, analgesia were given, but was discouraged. And the light sedation group, like I, I Say just now they can use dex propofol or midazolam whatever the clinician want to use so surprise surprise between non-sedation and light sedation there is no mortality different between the two groups primary outcome show no significant difference between uh, of 90 day mortality okay so in non-sedation trial uh, this outcome is the same but i want to show you some important part is that in non-sedated group having not using minimal or almost no sedation at all, they showed to have a reduction, significant reduction in major thrombotic event. So patient having PE or DVT, almost uh, 10 times higher, eh, sorry, 10 times lower when the patient not given any sedation, 0.3% and 2.8%. So however, in the non not sedated group, it has been shown also there is an increase in accidental extubation and accidental removal of other equipment. So, so okay, no sedation is good, but how? No sedation, is it doable? Yes, by using energy first sedation. And you have to use sedative agent if uh, indicated, okay? But you have to be mindful of accidental event, 9% of unplanned extubation and 15% of removal of equipment. So back to the poll that I give you just now. Uh, let's look at the result. So it shows here, uh, six eighty percent of you all uh, 
will bolus and increase media fentanyl. Uh, only 20% say uh, off sedation. Uh, continue the same rate is uh, none. Okay, so there's two vote for off sedation. There's one of it is me. Lah. Okay, so for this patient, like case study just now, uh, this patient initially to begin with, he was on midazolam and fentanyl. Okay, so because at that time he was having high ventilator setting, but now oxygenation and chest x ray improving, organ failure also improving, no vasopressors, but patient do look uh, agitated. Okay, so uh, if you uh, based on the presentation that I did just now, uh, you should actually, uh, you can bolus the fentanyl and then you can off the sedation. Okay. So deeply sedated critical care. So moving on uh, in, a, in a simplified manner, uh, deeply sedated critical care, which is the norm and practice way back then, it leads to higher mortality, longer days on ventilator, higher rates of VAP, higher rates and complicated bad source, worse cognitive outcome, more severe delirium, poor patients and family satisfaction. Okay, So we do now want to move and shift from the dark from dark to light, okay, from deep to light sedation and towards a better future for our critical care patient. So internationally, all over the world, uh, there is a growing movement of practicing awake and walking ICU, I mean awake and walking critical care patient, okay. So like this example, patient is intubated, the lung compliant is still bad, still require a high ventilator support, but you don't want them to be intubated, sedated almost all the time. If they feel pain due to the ETT, you can give analgesic. And then you can ask them to move around, walk with the ventilator, even with the ventilator, okay? So it saves more life, more freedom from, from ventilators, low rates of HAP, VAP, less bad sore, better cognitive outcome, no delirium, and able to do physiotherapy, able to, 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 uh, to do more physiotherapy, and good patients and family satisfaction, okay? If you want to know more and you want to see more uh, remarkable uh, physiotherapy in the, in the, in the internationally in the US, I usually follow this working home from the ICU Instagram. So you can see their Instagram, working home from the ICU. They show a lot of example of uh, how we can do this, how we can give more and more patients for physiotherapy and lead to awake and walking ICU. Okay, so this is my last uh, section. Is that uh, how we do? How we want to put sedation practice? How we, how we want to put our knowledge into practice? So I have developed this sedative analgesic algorithm, uh, basically as my as a guide for my MOs in the ICU to use. And I think you can, you guys can use as well. And uh, let's have a look. Okay, so when you approach the patient, the the best evidence-based practice for non-pharmacological approach of sedation. You have to think first of non-pharmacological. Okay, non-pharmacological approach has been shown to reduce delirium by almost 50% from uh, this uh, about 1,300 patient studies. Okay, so the multi-components included improving cognition, sedation practice, sleep disruption, immobility, and use of hearing glass and aids. So, uh, so this summarized for non-pharmacological approach is that when you have the patient intubated, mechanically ventilated patient in the critical care, you have first to improve orientation and cognition. From my experience, the best drug, sorry, the best treatment approach is actually talk to the patient. That's the most powerful. It beats even presidex, propofol, midazolam. You just have to talk to the patient. So when the patient is waking up, you have to talk to the patient. You have to reorient them every shift and daily. You have to tell them what time is it, where are you? What happened to you? Because when they are exposed to midazolam and all, they will have this amnesia, retrograde, anterograde amnesia. So they can't remember, they are confused. They are waking up in the ICU, such a strange place. They don't know what has happening to them. Of course, they will get delirium and agitated. So the most powerful thing, if you can take from my talk today is to talk to the patient, okay? That's the number one and the most powerful drug, okay? To sedate the patient, talk to the patient, reorient it every shift and daily. So you have to improve the cognitive stimulation of the patient. Use of pencil, pen, paper. So patient in my ICU, I think medical MO and specialists that have seen in my ICU, my practice that I encourage them to use handphone while they are intubated. 
so they can improve their coordination, the train coordination training and cognitive training by WhatsApping their their family, uh, video call, uh, selfies and so on. Okay, and you have to use hearing aids. I even borrow hearing aids uh, from the uh, from the speech therapist. And you have to ask the family to bring their glasses for them to have a more better visual 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 uh, patient yang pakai apa spec. Okay, you have to bring back the spec for them to use. Okay, so you have to improve your good sedation practice. Like that's that's why we have this talk. You have to treat the pain first and minimize sedative agents usage. Okay, and you have to improve the sleep period, light and noise reduction at night at 10 p.m. onward, and use of iPads and earplugs. So in my ICU. We bought uh, iPads for the patient for them to use at night and uh, earplugs because IC is very noisy with a lot of sound of the machines and you have to early rehabilitation and do mobilization for the patient. So in, into my algorithm, so at all time you have to emphasize on the analgo sedation as well as non-pharmacological non -pharmacological approach that I said just now. So at the start of every ICU shift, Look for any indication for deep sedation. Is the patient requiring cerebral protection, post cardiac arrest care, high vasoactive agent, high ventilator setting, any prone position, massive pulmonary hemorrhage, uh, any bronchospasm, tetanus, or neuromuscular blocking agent? If yes, then you should aim for deep sedation. Document in the, the case note you want to have the RAS goal for this shift as minus three to minus five. Okay, then you look at the hemodynamic stability, whether the patient is unstable or stable. Okay, so if the patient is unstable, first you have to assess pain via CPOT. Okay, CPOT or BPS, the behavioral tool to assess pain when the patient cannot communicate with you. Okay, so if the CPOT of three or more, or do you see there is a obvious source of pain like polytrauma, chest tube here, laparotomy wound, uh, fracture here and there. So, of course, the patient will be in a lot of pain. So, you have to optimize fentanyl, uh, opioid. You want to use morphine also can. Uh, fentanyl also can, doesn't, uh, doesn't really matter. Okay, so then, uh, okay, after the optim, uh, once you optimize the fentanyl, support less than three. And then, usually, if you don't know support less than three, usually I will, patient with a lot of source of pain, usually I will give about 50 mic per hour, around 30 to 50 mic per hour. And, and then you have to check the target RAS. If the target RAS is minus three, if the target RAS has not been achieved, let's say the patient have a RAS of zero, but he requires deep sedation, then you can in, add on midazolam to achieve RAS of minus three to minus five, okay? So if the patient is stable and you assess the patient and you think the patient might be able to extubate early, then you go to the yes early extubation. You have to assess the pain first. You have to see whether the uh, how much is, whether the target rest has already been achieved or not. And then if the if if yes early extubation, usually we will uh, prefer to use propofol because propofol has a predictable offset and onset and can be used for deep sedation. Okay, so propofol is a good deep sedation agent uh, with a uh for patient with hemodynamic stability and uh it's used for patient that you can think can you think can estubate early okay okay you can use profile up to 200 milligram per hour or if it's too much or starting to have hemodynamic instability you can add on midazolam so for if you think patient cannot be extubated early it require longer than 72 hours of extubation you can use uh go to the no if the patient are requiring cerebral protection, severe asthma or CPD, you can jump towards this pathway because uh, there is a benefit of using propofol for cerebral protection patient because it's uh, the best neuroprotective agent. And it also have a bronchodilation property for severe asthma and bronchospasm for COPD. Other, other than that, you can use midazolam as a sedative agent. Okay, so back up there, if you, at the next shift, if you think, the NORAD already coming down, ventilator setting is better, no indication for deep sedation, you should, should, should think to go to light sedation, okay? So your target rush, you have to document is minus two to plus one. You have to assess the pain first. If your patient can communicate good, if your patient cannot, you have to check the C port or BPS score. You have to optimize the fentanyl and then you have to check your uh, rush, okay? If the patient is still deeply sedated, 
after initially deep sedated then now patient is already still still heavily sedated rust is still minus three to minus five you should off the sedative agent you can titrate the fentanyl if the patient is agitated combative and patient is hemodynamic stability if patient is very stable you can use propofol first because propofol is a very predictable offset and but if your patient uh, develop frequent apnea you can switch over to dexmedetomidin okay if the if patient is recovering but combative and somewhat relatively unstable and recovering hemodynamic stability you can use dexmedetomidin because comparing dexmedetomidin to propofol is actually around about the same application of bradycardia if you use the dose correctly are about the same okay so but for me i will go towards dexmedetomidin okay so once the target rust minus two to plus one achieve you actually have to look for delirium by doing chem icu scoring and uh, communicate cognitive reorientation improve visualization and hearing like i said okay so i include this a little bit about icu is painful for us to re be reminded regarding pain the the important and the important importance to treat pain first in the icu so summary, a proposed sedation practice for critically ill patients will make significant difference in patient outcome. Light sedation practice is safe and indicated for almost all patients and is best evidence practice. Uh, treatment, treating pain is the utmost important before starting any sedative agent and I'll go sedation practice. Knowledge and practice need to be brief so more favorable outcome can be achieved. Mindasolam, propofol and dexmedetomidin have their own role in management of sedation in ICU. Although dexmedetomidin shows many favorable properties of either sedative agent, the use must be limited in critical care area in which proper and continuous monitoring is available, such as medication due, IM, and so on. So I will not recommend to use dexmedetomidin or propofol in the normal world, unless you can monitor and you know how to use it correctly. So keep calm and give propofol, dexmedetomidin or midazolam. No, give pentanil first, treat pain first. Thank you. Any question? Thank you very much.